Busan International Film Festival opened on October 6th. This October event gathers lots of uh, attention from movie makers and fans from all around the world. So we want to discuss what this 21st gathering of the event itself means for not only Korean movie industry and for the world as well, right here in this program, Upfront. On October 6, the 21st Busan International Film Festival finally kicked off. A lot of renowned figures from the global film industry and movie fans from all around the world visited Busan to enjoy the festival which takes place for 10 days. Such a great attention from the world has boosted the fever of the festival as well. 아시아 영화인들에게는 자신을 가장 알리, 잘 알릴 수 있고 또 자신의 영화를 전 세계 영화인들 그리고 영화 산업계에 알릴 수 있는 가장 훌륭한 장소가 부산 국제 영화제입니다. 그렇기 때문에 부산 국제 영화제에 참 참가를 굉장히 적극적으로 시도하고 있고요. A Quiet Dream, which was directed by Korean Chinese director Lu Zhang, opened the festival. And it has been five years since a Korean film was selected as an opening film. And The Dark Wind by Iraqi director Hussein Hassan brings down the curtain of the festival. 일단 국제적인 면에서는 아시아 영화의 흐름을 가장 먼저 만나볼 수 있는 어, 가장 큰 규모의 행사라는 점 그리고 한국 영화의 모든 것을 만날 수 있다는 점이 어, 국내나 아시아 영화인들 뿐만 아니라 전 세계의 영화인들이 부산 영화제에 주목하고 또 부산 영화제를 끊임없이 찾는 이유가 될 건데요. The official poster of the Busan International Film Festival portrays Korean red pine, which takes its roots deep in the ground and survives through any kind of harsh environment. It has also reflected the festival's persistence and solidity, as well as its strong will to continue on for the future. Various programs have been promoted to boost communication between people from the film industry and the audience and to seek vision for the Asian film industry in the future. This year's festival features 299 films from 69 countries from around the world. Also, it includes 96 world premieres, which shows a strong influence of the Busan International Film Festival on the global film market. Global status of the Busan International Film Festival has been built along with the development of the Korean film industry. It's been 21 years since the establishment of the Busan International Film Festival in 1996. Along with the increase in investment from the local government and growing support from the public, the festival itself has achieved a great growth during the past decades. And the budget for the event has increased about five times for the past years. And the Busan International Film Festival has now become one of the most influential film festivals in Asia, presenting over 300 films from 60 countries. 전 세계의 영화계 역시 최근 아시아 영화에 대한 관심이 높아지면서 이제 아시아 영화의 새로운 흐름 그리고 새로운 어, 창의적인 어떤 힘을 가지고 있는 젊은 작가들을 어, 발견하고 또 함께 작업하기 위해서 부산 국제 영화를 찾죠. 그 점이 아마 전 세계 영화인들이 부산 국제 영화제에서 얻고자 하는 가장 큰 목표이자 장점이라고 생각합니다. Aside from the growth of the festival itself. Busan International Film Festival has contributed a lot to introducing a lot of Korean films abroad. After a film Peppermint Candy directed by Yi Chang-dong was shown as the opening film of the festival 17 years ago, it has received great reviews from overseas film industries and it has also paved the way for other Korean film directors to better introduce their films at a lot of renowned film festivals like the Cannes Film Festival. 
A lot of Korean films have received remarkable reviews and have garnered a great attention from a variety of international film festivals. What kind of additional efforts are needed for the Korean film industry in order to become a strong growth engine for a long period of low growth? Along with the 21st Busan International Film Festival, which has recently kicked off, Upfront discusses the remaining challenges and future of the Korea's film industry. Well, for today's discussion, we have interesting lineup of guests here. On my left side, Darcy Pocket, a renowned film critic and an expert of Korean movies, of course. And he's also founder and editor of the website, koreafilm.org. Welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And mm -hmm. Michael Unger, professor at the uh, Seogang University's Graduate School of Media. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you for having me as well. This actually is a very exciting topic. Uh, personally, I'm sure a lot of viewers joining us from all around the world mm -hmm. are very much interested in Korean movies as well. So mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, is a very interesting topic. Just let's talk about the, the discussion with the, uh, the BIFF, B-I-F-F, -F, Busan International Film Festival. Starting at 1996, this is its uh, 21st year. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people would say this is Asia's leading uh, film festival, I suppose. Uh, how do we explain this uh, interesting success of BIF, uh, you know, within readily, relatively speaking, short period of time, 21st years? Professor Ingo? Well, I think, uh, to me, uh, PIF is a little bit uh, emblematic of uh, the Sundance Film Festival when it first started out, in the sense that the founders of the festival, uh, to me, uh, were really cinema lovers with all different aspects of Korean film. And, what started as perhaps one of the few venues uh, for independent film or Korean film or alternative uh, Korean films to be viewed uh, quickly grew mm -hmm. through word of mouth uh, because I think uh, all types of film goers and filmmakers are always interested in seeing what the latest trends are mm -hmm. and what's new and exciting. Um, and with that uh, success, um, PIF rapidly, I think, became the largest film festival because it just offered such innovative programming mm. uh, during its uh, short run. So in that sense, uh, I think Professor Unger uh, emphasized the artistic side of it from the beginning. Now mm. a lot of people seem to see PIF as, because it's such a big event, uh, see a lot of commercial side of it as well. Yeah. At least that's the impression these days. But would you agree with Professor Ng uh, Unger's uh, observation that it started off as a more artistic focused uh, event? Yeah, I mean, the organizers themselves had been to different festivals in Europe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the mid-1990s, Korea didn't have a film festival of right. this type. It right. was a completely new mm -hmm. kind of experience for Korean viewers. And, you know, a film festival is not just a place to go and watch films. There's a community that forms during the festival. You know, films that might not get much attention if they were just released in theaters right. can become a sensation at the film festival yeah. with everybody talking <laughs> about them. And so it's a really special kind of event and a mm -hmm. special kind of space. And what really opened people's eyes about Busan was the passion of the viewers. Mm -hmm. That I mean, so many more people than expected came down from Seoul right. or other parts of Korea to attend the festival. And you know, visiting critics and filmmakers were just kind of shocked at the size of the crowds and then the the passion of the, the viewers. A lot of people seem to be saying similar things about other film festivals festivals that Korea is hosting, like, uh, yeah. I don't know, Jeonju, for yeah. one, and mm -hmm. uh, Bucheon Festival is a little bit specialized here, but mm -hmm. uh, they're talking about this, the fans' devotion in a way, right? Yeah. Overall, uh, what's your observation about uh, other festivals together with BIF, perhaps, to generalize uh, the strength and then, and then overall uh, tra trajectory of development of these uh, film festivals in Korea? Yeah, I mean, even though we're talking about BIF and then these other film festivals in particular, mm -hmm. I think that it's kind of an expression of something that's broader in Korean society. And that, you know, in the 1990s especially, there was a really strong sense of cinephilia that took off across the country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people were really interested in movies from all around the world. And uh, it was that curiosity that helped these film festivals to grow. Uh, you know, since those festivals started, uh, I mean, the Korean film market has changed very much. I mean, mm -hmm. Korean cinema itself has become much more powerful. Mm -hmm. and so, Commercially as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. And so these festivals, they play perhaps a slightly different role than they did at the beginning. Or you might say their role has expanded mm -hmm. beyond its original mm -hmm. role. 
And I think as the uh, Korean uh, film industry is also diversified and expanded as well, it's nice to have specialized film festivals in Korea. For example, the Animation Film Festival, uh, Women Who Make Movies Film Festival. I just finished being a jury member at the Seoul International Youth Film Festival, mm -hmm. which I think is one of the third largest film festivals dedicated towards young filmmakers uh, premiering their work and also uh, professional filmmakers dealing with the issues of youth or so. Mm -hmm. so I'm very happy to see uh, that there's more and more, let's say, um, specialized festivals that address a specific topic that may otherwise maybe kind of be lost a little bit in a much larger venue, let's say. Interesting you mentioned those points because uh, some of our viewers may think, uh, think of this issue as a chicken and egg uh, issue, which comes first and which one is which. Do these film festivals actually generate, uh, offer big push to the movie industry or uh, I guess it's both but uh, f from your perspective mm -hmm. uh, you know because a lot of people will say well there must be something else that was going on in the Korean movie industry that made these festivals successful on the other aspect of it well, which one do you think is, is more important if I have to ask you that question oh, um, you mean the chicken and the egg between yeah, yeah the, and the, the festival festivals? programs on one hand and then yeah. the growth of the movie industry which, uh, you know, cause, oh, I, I causal do think, effect is... I do think they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, I think with the um, amount of funding that uh, Korean films uh, get from the Korean government, which is wonderful in promoting uh, Korean film uh, and art overseas, uh, I think that does a great service uh, bringing the mainstream uh, Korean cinema into the international arena. But also, I, I think what's important is that the film festivals offer a venue for, uh, again, I would maybe say independent or certain filmmakers that mm -hmm. wouldn't have that opportunity in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So like a, a Kim Ki Duck in the beginning or a Hong Song Su who first established a reputation at the film festivals creates uh, a buzz mm -hmm. or even uh, a word of mouth mm -hmm. um, encouraging uh, the investors in the film industry sometimes to then approach them and say, wow, this you know, this film or this director uh, or this topic has uh, commercial appeal. and uh, from that, uh, a, a larger audience is formed. Um, I can just name one quick example. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was down in PIF in 2010, I met the, the director, Young, Young E. Juk, uh, mm -hmm. who did uh, Breathless. Breathless. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really nice guy, wonderful guy. And um, I really was impressed with his film when it came out mm -hmm. uh, due to its uh, subject matter and his low budget techniques. And it was just so great at the film festival to meet him in person and mm -hmm. As a, as a critic and as a, as a professor, I'd be able to talk to him in person about how he approached it. And I think because of the word of mouth, it ended up being the most independently viewed film in mm -hmm. Korea of 2008 mm -hmm. at that Interesting time. Interesting story right there. And uh, Mr. Paquette, the, the pulling effect of these kind of festivals, yeah. you know, to what extent uh, PIF, uh, Busan International Film Festival, uh, what kind of impact it made mm. on the uh, Korean movie industry? Or is it just a pure expression? I mean, because Korean mm. movie industries were growing on their own, it was just an outlet to express its growth and then describe its growth. Uh, what do you see? Uh, you know, which side was stronger? Well, I think that, I mean, the beginning of a film's career is very important. Like mm. the first time that it's introduced to viewers. And, you know, if you're a filmmaker and you want, especially if you're a young filmmaker who's not very well known, uh, the way that you present the film for the first time can in some ways affect the fate of the film. And what really gives, I think, Korean filmmakers an advantage in having a film festival like PIF is that when you screen the film for the first time, you know, it's not just in a theater competing against some big Hollywood blockbuster, uh, but the festival kind of gathers together a lot of interested people. And because of that, you can get a, you know, a good reaction from the audience if it's a good film. Uh, at the same time, there are people from all over the world, you know, festival programmers who are there in the audience, and they're seeing, you know, viewers react to the film. And so if a film is well received, then often it gets invitations to other film festivals around the world. Um, you know, there, there are some film festivals who, or there are some film directors who end up finding great wide, you know, widespread commercial appeal. Mm. Uh, others who become very successful but don't become famous. They become successful as right. making very interesting films mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. traveling to many film festivals. and or Developing a niche audience or even a, a cult audience at times yeah. uh, right. through the festivals venue. Mm -hmm. I can see the dynamics better with your explanation here. Let's move on talking about the Korean movies uh, themselves. Uh, uh, 
Mr. Paquette, uh, what are some of the important names and then, and then uh, the, the productions or, or creation that you're keeping your eyes on this time in, mm -hmm. in Busan, perhaps, or yeah. you know, recent days? I mean, Busan, it offers two different types of films, uh, Korean films. There are a selection of films that made a big impression throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of gathered together in Busan. And so people coming from other countries or people who haven't seen these films yet can catch up on them. And it has been a really strong year, I think, for Korean cinema. And so, I mean, you know, movies like, you know, The Handmaiden or The Wailing <laughs> right. or Age of Shadows, right. these are really, you know, big productions that have been successful abroad, but then are being screened here. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there are also a lot of new films by lesser known directors. And, you know, the festival will be a time when critics kind of watch through these films and they discover, you know, what's interesting among this new crop of lesser known mm -hmm. filmmakers. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's one that I'm particularly excited about called The Table. And what is it called again? The Table. The Table. Oh, yes. Okay, heard about that. Uh, it's right. a film that takes place in a cafe, mm -hmm. and it's four extended conversations that take place at the same table mm -hmm. in the course of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a very, very simple concept. It's just, you know, conversations, and yet they have a great cast. <laughs> The Four name really of the director well is Kim Jong Gwan. Kim Jong Gwan. Okay, I thought uh, it was one of the big names, but it, this is up and rising. Yeah, he's an up and coming filmmaker. I mm -hmm. mean, it, people who are interested in independent film know his name. He's right. uh, been making interesting, mm -hmm. lesser known films for a while, but but people will know the cast because it's actresses like Im Soo Jung mm -hmm. and Chung Yumi and Some Han Yeri. established names. Yeah, and so it's a good example of how kind of established stars are taking mm -hmm. an interest in independent film. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the past, I think maybe you had a more clear separation, like the big stars would be in the big films. Right, right. Um, Together with the big name uh, movie directors and so on. Right. Yeah, but I think a lot of well-known stars are realizing now that you can appear in low-budget independent films mm -hmm. and find more interesting roles, mm -hmm. and even if it doesn't make you more rich, <laughs> right, right. that it offers a lot of opportunities interesting as well. Interesting new trend. Yeah. Professor Unger, oh, yeah. yes, please. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say that I also think uh, the appeal of the PIF uh, Film Festival also is not just showcasing uh, the Korean films uh, per se, but also encouraging cooperation, international cooperation, mm -hmm. and kind of transnational cinema. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I met a, a young filmmaker from Taiwan uh, who's going to the Pusan Film Festival, uh, and this will be his fourth time uh, screening uh, his work there. And it was mm. through the Pusan Film Festival that it, he was able to start his career mm -hmm. in, in Taiwan with uh, having very little resources at the very beginning or so. And I think a lot of the foreign filmmakers or maybe film critics who love Korean cinema, when they first arrive uh, at Pusan and they meet the actual directors or the actors or so, there's a lot of excitement and buzz about it right. because um, you know now they're, they have their first uh, personal or intimate experience with mm -hmm. uh, the makers themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is that uh, important aspect and even pan-Asian dimension of mm -hmm. the festival itself. Uh, I want to continue on with you, Professor Unger. I was going to ask you this question: If a foreign, uh, you know, friend or someone foreigner who's not familiar with Korean movie. Uh, you know, landscape, ask you a question about mm -hmm. why should I like Korean movies and what are some of the important pieces mm -hmm. that I have to catch up with, ah. the, you know, the movies and the movie makers so far. What would you say? This is a big picture question. Oh, what I'd say? I'd first say uh, check out Darcy's uh, website. I mean, when I, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, when right. I first moved here and I did not know much about uh, Korean cinema, uh -huh. I mean, I honestly, I, th I, I always would looked at your website and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. just uh, learned a lot about it uh, just from watching and going to the film festivals. Um, I think a lot of people start with the Korean wave of the 90s and the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So they'll mm -hmm. look at the Park Chan-wook or the Kim Ji-un, mm -hmm. and I think those are good places to start. Mm -hmm. But also I think um, Korean cinema goes back to the 1920s, and right. so for the real cinephiles, mm -hmm. uh, there's some really wonderful work uh, that you can go all the way back. And one of my favorites, first favorite filmmakers was Kim ji Young. Oh, um, quite a while ago. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. And he was such a bizarre character. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he started off as a doctor and then right. went into filmmaking. And he kind of did everything, kind of like, a, mm -hmm. I kind of consider him like a Korean Fassbender. And um, <laughs> what I loved about his films is that anything could happen. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what this film ultimately would end up being like. Right, right. So um, 
so I think different people obviously are looking for different types of experiences when they're looking at uh, Korean films. So in a way, um, like an endless bonanza in a way, if you have the, all these different interests, you can go as far as that, oh, that yeah. age and stuff. But, but let's talk more about the, the <laughs> recent ones. How do you explain this, the, the surge that you mentioned, uh, the, the rise of, fast rise of Korean movies since the end of 90s and, yeah. and 2000? Uh, a lot of people are wondering about that. You know, uh, uh, Koreans uh, ourselves felt mm -hmm. quite weak about movie industry before that point, even though we had big names like Im Gon Tag and uh, others uh, once in a while. And I, I guess Kang Jae Gyu kind of opened the path at yeah. the end of the 1990s in terms of commercial blockbusters and so on. But how do we explain this sudden rise of really promising, uh, you know, movie makers kind of simultaneously at the end of 1990s mm -hmm. and 2000? How do we explain that? Yeah, this is the big question. Uh, it's something that I've spent a lot of time writing about. Yeah, thinking about. Yeah, <laughs> one coming from you. <laughs> um, and I mean, looking into it, I think that I mean, my conclusion with, was that there wasn't one particular reason. That okay. It was a combination of reasons. Sure. Mm. But I think that um, I mean, one thing to say is that even though we saw the results of this in the late 1990s, I think that the the factors that contributed to that change may have taken place about 10 years earlier. And so in the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, Korea used to have a very restricted film industry. Mm -hmm. Censors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, censorship and also mm -hmm. the way that the industry was constructed. Right. Like it was very difficult to produce films under mm -hmm. the old system. Right, right. And things opened up quite a bit. Uh, so first you had a new generation of producers who came in and they were very passionate about making films in a new yeah. way. Mm. Uh, and ultimately, it was that group of producers that brought in an even younger generation of new directors. And you know, if you if you look at any time over the course of Korean film history, mm -hmm. and you had to pick five years, um, I mean, in some ways, the most exciting five years were right. between '96 and 2000. Mm. I see. Because mm. you had so many directors who are really famous now right, right. Uh, make their debut in that period. Right. All the names that yeah. Professor Unger just mentioned, I suppose, I mean, yeah, many yeah, of those yeah. names. And I think the timing was really right, too. Um, I mean, I think for, let's say, uh, American viewers who are not so intimate or uh, know Asian cinema uh, or not, do, do not know it very well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for example, there was a video store in New York City, Kim's Video, and mm -hmm. that was my venue of finding uh, hot Asian films or so. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like at first there was the Japanese films of the 1980s and mm -hmm. Hong Kong cinema with John Woo and Chung Young Fat. And mm -hmm. then suddenly the Korean films uh, started to appear mm -hmm. uh, at uh, all the, the video stores and in these uh, independent films. And they were very, they were different. Mm -hmm. They were different mm -hmm. and um, you know, they were uh, technically uh, accomplished. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think they were very heartfelt mm -hmm. in their emotions. Right, right. Um, and, uh, and this is good, and I think this is also bad. They, there also was a feeling that they were extreme. extreme. Like uh, Tartan Extreme Cinema kind of, I think, marketed like that aspect. Like old boy style? Those, yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, right. people were saying, wow, you know, the right. Koreans are really, really intense right. experiences. Because never, we like spicy food. Like that. I'm just kidding. But, but, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's, it's funny you mention that, because I think um, the other thing that uh, the Koreans uh, have done well is uh, taking uh, genres mm -hmm and making them fresh again. And that's one of the reasons why I like right. uh, Kim Ji-un, like mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the good and the bad and the weird. I was thinking I mean, about that, right? I mean, wonderful homage to uh, right. Sergei Leone. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember in an interview I read that he said that he considered it not a spaghetti western, but a kimchi western, <laughs> because he put that wonderful twist about it taking place in Mongolia. And I think right. for a western <laughs> audience, that's, that's something fresh and something new that they have not seen. Right. And uh, it's really brought a lot more attention to mm -hmm. the Korean experience. Right, right, right. Very interesting phenomenon right there. I, I mean, we can spend a long time <laughs> talking <laughs> about the recent past, about this interesting yeah. surge and fast rise of Korean movies. But let's talk a little bit about the, what's happening now and then in the future, mm -hmm. perhaps. Uh, for instance, these days we see a lot of uh, you know, the, the Hollywood movie distributors coming mm -hmm. in to Korea, kind of becoming visible. Yeah. Uh, for instance, the distribution of The Howling, the very controversial and popular movie during the summertime. Mm -hmm. And then the, the recent one, The Age of the Shadows, yeah. was uh, distributed, is being distributed by Warner Brothers, for instance. Yeah. What kind of impact do we see in terms of this, this mixing of Hollywood side mm -hmm. and then, then the Korean movie making? Uh, what, what's the result we have to expect there, other than uh, making lots of money? Of right. Course, right? <laughs> I mean, that, in the end, it always is that. But, <laughs> uh, I mean, I see it as a very positive development. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to a certain extent, 
it's something that is a little bit late in happening mm -hmm. because I think that, you know, Fox has been very active in other countries around the world, right. producing local films. Mm -hmm. And these aren't films that they release in the U.S. always, or that, uh, but they have, from a long time back, recognized that, you know, if you produce films in local countries and in the, in the local language, mm -hmm. that you can be very successful doing that. And I think in the past there was interest in doing that in Korea as well, mm -hmm. but Korea had its own very powerful film companies. Right. And I think and they have been quite active actually investing overseas or joining yes. forces with like DreamWorks and then mm -hmm. you know the other other uh, cooperations as well, right? Yeah, I mean mm -hmm. CJ is a really interesting story because mm -hmm. they you know they have their roots in uh, these connections to Hollywood, and they're very big in Southeast Asia these days, mm -hmm. you know, producing films in Vietnam and in Indonesia and Thailand and. Uh, and so, I mean, these Korean companies are really big players. And, but I think what we're seeing now is that directors are interested in working with Hollywood studios. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some directors are going to Hollywood and shooting films, but, um, but also there's an interest in working with Hollywood studios in Korea. Right. Uh, in a way, I think it's a good opportunity for filmmakers because mm -hmm. it just gives you more options. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're, you have a big project that you yeah. want to make and you need a big budget, it's a very different possibilities. Commercially ambitious film. Right, right. You know, you can make it with CJ or with Lotte, or, mm -hmm. but now you have these other options. Mm -hmm. And so always, I think, more options is a better right. thing for filmmakers. Uh, perhaps a more difficult and question. Yes, please, add on. All right, and yeah. also I think it's also great bringing uh, more Asian filmmakers, let's say, to uh, the Hollywood market mm -hmm. and the Western market, where, mm -hmm. um, again, there has been, uh, even though there's a large Asian uh, population in the United States, there's not much, mm -hmm. not many uh, films or even television shows that kind of uh, express their experiences or so. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think um, in Hollywood, always looking for new content, mm -hmm. new mm -hmm. stories, um, find that this is a very uh, valuable source mm -hmm. uh, in which they could find hopefully those things. Sometimes they work well uh, mm -hmm. in, in the translation, let's say, from the, the Korean version, let's say, to the American version, right, like right. Old Boy mm -hmm. with Spike Lee. Right. Um, mm -hmm. With, um, and sometimes maybe not so much, mm -hmm. but I think mm -hmm. that's uh, fresh territory both for the Koreans to be challenged, to say, let me see what it's like to do it in a I, I Hollywood guess venue. I such efforts versa. will continue perhaps, right? The, oh yeah, I think so, was, absolutely. And it's going the other ways too. I think, you know, the mm -hmm. Koreans are also taking some American content and making it a Korean as well. Right. You know, the television right. show Suits, I believe, is mm -hmm. going to be a, made as a Korean a version right. of it very soon. Right. And, mm -hmm. Uh, inter so, in, in, interaction both ways, I suppose. Yeah, and that, that's very exciting, transnational cinema, because the cinema world is becoming more and more right. international. Right. So, um, and in a way, I think that's what made Hollywood uh, what it was back mm. in the 1930s and 40s with all the immigrants coming in and, and mm. adding their experience to, right. to the expression. Right. He just mentioned a very important point about the uh, transnational interaction here. Uh, I guess uh, then, having talked about Hollywood here, what about China that seems to be coming mm. up from behind? Yeah. Uh, what kind of challenge does it raise for Korea and opportunity? Uh, what mm. do you see it in that sense? It's been really interesting to see the relationship between the Korean and Chinese film industries develop. Mm -hmm. Um, China has a really strong interest, I think, in cooperating with Korea. Because, because we have contents, yeah, stories. And, and they recognize that Korea has a lot of ability in terms of, you know, telling, in terms of storytelling and packaging and marketing. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. I mean, all of the different kinds of know-how that you need uh, to make a really interesting, you know, cultural product that'll mm -hmm. attract a lot of viewers. And so, you know, China sees Korea as a place that they can learn, mm -hmm. learn from, mm -hmm. uh, whereas for Korean filmmakers or for Korean film companies, uh, China is obviously such a big market. Right. Uh, it's an opportunity to reach a, a huge audience. And so yeah. you know, up to this point, there's been a lot of interest on both sides. And mm -hmm. so we've seen so. kind of things move very quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, there are challenges in working across cultures. But Do you see sure. Korean movies yeah. uh, becoming more like uh, kind of uh, palatable for Chinese movie uh, audiences? Oh uh, gosh, that's a hard question for me to answer because I'm not mm -hmm. so familiar with the chi Chinese mm -hmm. audiences are looking right. for. Right, I wonder about that uh, as well. Yeah. Beyond, obviously, I think like all audiences, mm -hmm. uh, you want to have a good story, you want to have an mm -hmm. emotional experience uh, when watching the film. But I also, I think that what Darcy was saying uh, is apt in that the, the audiences are maybe looking to Korean films mm -hmm. as a way or as a cue to figure out how could they perhaps become 
uh, more cosmopolitan and reaching both uh, their own markets and perhaps more uh, international mm. markets abroad. Mm. Chinese becoming more universal <clears throat> through Korea, I suppose. Perhaps they, yeah, they use that as a, I think as as one way of like, hmm, they're doing it very well. Yeah. Um, we should, you know, pay attention to mm. them and mm. see what what works for them, and then figure out what works for us. Brilliant and wonderful, uh, I guess, speculation. Yeah, we have to see, I mean, but it makes perfect sense yeah. right here. Uh, you know, you've been a uh, observer of Korean movie for so long, movie industry for so long. Mm -hmm. One uh, another kind of like puzzle in the minds of international watchers: Why are Koreans watching so many movies? I mean, we're yeah. talking about like <laughs> the, the size of Korean movie audience, right? Uh, mm -hmm. These days, uh, for a Korean movie to become really successful, you, you yeah. have to pass that. The, the point of 10 million yeah. uh, movie goers, yeah. that's a lot of people <laughs> here. How, I, I wonder myself, yeah. uh, Mr. Paquette, how do you explain it? Why are Koreans so movie crazy? Well, it's a really hard thing to explain because, I mean, Koreans at this point watch more movies per capita than any other country in the world. Number one in the world? Yeah, it okay. used to be I Iceland. Guess it is. Yeah, Iceland. Oh, Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a country with a long winter, <laughs> you know, a good place to watch movies. And actually, Korea has passed them. Oh. And, I mean, I think that some of the forces that are taking place at this point are that, you know, whereas 10 years ago or 15 years ago, movie going was primarily for younger people. Yeah. And it was right. less common for people to go to the to the movies after they got married, or mm -hmm. uh, there was, it wasn't as common for you to bring your kids to the movie theater. Right. And also older viewers. Mm -hmm. um, there's been kind of a, a revolution in some ways in that, um, you know, viewers in their 50s and their 60s are much more interested in film than they used to be. Mm -hmm. And there's some theaters in Seoul who are very successful in kind of catering to an older audience. Um, and you can see the change to a certain extent in the movies as well, that mm -hmm. there are certain kind of movies that appeal to young people, mm -hmm. um, but other kinds of movies that appeal to an older, uh, you know, an older audience. And so, offering, offering variety? Yeah. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And so because I think the, you know, the, uh, the range of people watching movies in Korea has grown, mm -hmm. and because Korea is a country where you know, everything's very well connected, and so right. when everybody starts talking about a certain film, ah, through the mouth. Yeah. it spreads all throughout society, Words of the mouth. and right. everybody feels that, you know, I need to see this film so mm -hmm. I can take part in this conversation. Conversation, yeah, right, the actually. social pressure, right. Yeah. And right. I think, yeah, the, the movie-going experience mm -hmm. is still uh, very alive here. I mean, mm -hmm. even though there's all this pay-per-view and downloading and right. everything you can do at home, mm -hmm. uh, getting out and uh, going to the movies and making it an event, mm -hmm. uh, I think is also part of the experience. And you know, the venues here are just so wonderful. I mean, right. you'll be able to see, if, uh, <laughs> right. I've seen films in 2D, 3D, even 4D. <laughs> I've been in movie theaters where you have little cubicles right, and right. ones with tables and right. one you can eat food. And it is an innovation. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of a, a wonderful uh, right. you know, experience to, to do that. Right. And I also think that um, the younger generation, mm. or the young generation, they want to see their experiences reflected on the screen. And mm. uh, I think it's important that uh, with the, the success of the films or the Korean film industry, that it is bringing uh, issues or topics that uh, they can relate to and that they are concerned mm. with. Mm. So I think maybe like Train to Pusan, you know, the zombie right, the movie, one, it was right, a yeah. wonderful... It was a big surprise, uh, Big actually. surprise, yeah. and you know, it was maybe the right time for this big zombie movie to finally <laughs> uh, come to Korea. They were saying in Korea, zombie movies will never be successful, they were saying. Yeah. Yeah, but... Never say sudden, never. Right. Never say never when right. it comes to films. Um, yeah. There's and a whole string look. of those. They used to say sports movies will never yeah. be successful, yeah. or movies about animals will never be successful. <laughs> and then everyone was proven wrong over yeah. time. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Professor Unger, the, the unique <coughs> Korean practice mm. in the media, they always talk about break-even point. Break-even point. Right, okay. in mm -hmm. terms of money-making in the you know, uh -huh. movie-making industries. Uh -huh. Breaking even point is not something that's publicly shared as often in countries like the United States, isn't it? it, it isn't it more private thing? Uh, some people say this is very uniquely Korean, talking about breaking uh. even point, uh, revealing all the cost of a movie production, mm. uh, sharing <laughs> with the entire world, or at right. least in Korea. Uh, well, I, right I, observation. Well, I'm not sure if the information we get is very accurate, perhaps. But uh, in right. terms of uh, the, um, the American system, mm -hmm. I mean, you can you can find out roughly what the budgets are, at least what the budgets are that they project. Ah. Um, I think what's uh, kind of unusual or uh, unique about the Korean system mm -hmm. is that 
Right now, uh, my impression with the, the big Hollywood studio system is that uh, the reason why we have so many superhero movies or so many sequels and remakes is because they're so big budgets mm -hmm. and they have to make so much more profit in order to make it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So like the marketing, the marketing is about as expensive as the movie itself. So you have a hundred million dollar movie, you gotta have a hundred million dollars in marketing. Mm -hmm. So you want to get maybe 300 million or 400 million profit mm -hmm. in order for the investors uh, to feel it's worthwhile. Um, and uh, you may know more about this, Darcy, in terms of how the actual system works, but mm -hmm. You know, uh, in, the, in the old Hollywood studio system, a studio would put out maybe 40 features a year. And they would kind of figure, well, you know, 10 would make a lot of money. Hopefully, they would have 10 hits. Mm -hmm. And 10 would do OK. And maybe 10 would be flops. But as long as we got 10 out of 40 going, things will be going well. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think uh, the break-even point is actually a, a kind of a, a nice thing because uh, mm -hmm. you don't have to make mega profits, you can still, uh, if you find an audience and you're able to satisfy the investors, uh, you can continue on. You can continue on with your career. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, here we'll take a look at an interview that we just added to this program. This is an interview with Mr. Kim Young-no. He's the director of photography uh, of this uh, recent uh, controversial and interesting movie, I suppose, uh, The Bacchus Lady. And he talks about his movie, the recent movie, as well as the overall issues of movie making in Korea, which we'll continue to discuss right after his interview. First, the Korean film is my personal thought, but it's fun. Then, the quality is very good. 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 관람객들도 허리우드 영화들을 고르지 않고 한국 영화를 고르시는 것 같고요. 천만 관객 시대라고 해서 되게 양적인 부분에 포커스를 맞추는 것 같은데 점점 우려되는 것들은 좀더 다양한 영화들이 좀 이렇게 나왔으면 좋겠는데 이왕이면 좀 허리가 더 강해졌으면 좋겠다는 생각을 합니다. 예를 들면 천만 영화가 한편 드는 것보다 300만 짜리 영화가 세편 드면 더 많은 영화인들이 그거를 통해서 더 그다음 이제 컨텐츠를 만들 수 있는 힘을 얻, 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 얻기 때문에 좀 다양한 영화들이 계속적으로 만들어질 수 있는 환경이 조금 더 리스크를 줄일 수, 있, 저, 줄일 수 있는 방법일 것 같습니다. 네, 과거에는 충무로를 기반으로 하고 있는 전통적인 투자 회사들과 대기업을 기반으로 하는 대형 이제 뭐 투자 회사들과의 어떤 양강 체제가 있었었는데요. 그게 한쪽이 이렇게 악화되면서 일방적인 대기업 중심의 대형 이제 배급사들만 남았어요. 그 와중에 지금 이제 새롭게 이제 배급사들이 혹은 투자사들이 들어오는 것들은 충무로 입장에서는 어쨌든 좀더 다양한 어떤 그 채널에서 돈이 들어오는 거니까 장점이 있다고는 생각을 합니다. 다만 좀 우려되는 상황들은 해외 배급사의 투자들이 늘고 있는데요. 그 어쨌든 그들이 이렇게 국내에 들어와서 투자를 하는 가장 큰 목적은 돈을 벌기 위한 것이기 때문에 반대로 뭐 한국 문화를 발전시키거나 한국 사회에서 꼭 필요한 얘기를 하려고 하는 부분들은 상대적으로 적을 것 같아요. 그래서 그 부분들에 대해서 조금 주의를 할 필요가 있을 것 같습니다. 죽여주는 여자는 탁골공원에서 활동하고 있는 바카스 아줌머니에 관한 얘기로요. 어, 되게 소외된 계층들의 어떤 좀 사회적으로 이렇게 보여주고 싶지 않은 얘기들이다 보니까 조금 메이저 그런 투자회사에서 투자를 받기 사실 쉽지는 않았어요. 그러다 보니 영화진흥위원회에서 어, 투자를 하게 되었고 어, 그런 기회로 영화가 어, 세상에서 세상에 나오게 되어가지고 참 다행이라고 생각을 하고요. 앞으로 이렇게 조금 좀 비상업적이라고 해도 우리 사회에서 필요한 얘기들이 계속 나올 수 있는 통로들이 계속 존재했으면 좋겠습니다. What's your observation about that issue, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to introduce uh, our audience to what we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, the, if we look at movie making from the perspective of the crew members and the staff, right. I mean, filmmaking is a very difficult mm -hmm. <laughs> activity. Labor intensive, one would say. Yeah, right. very labor intensive. It requires a lot of commitment. Mm -hmm. and, but it's something that people feel very passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think that we should probably distinguish between commercial films and independent films in this. Mm. Uh, because Are you know, saying commercial films tend to be made in a way that make uh, everybody kind of happy in terms of like movie making staff themselves? It's a, it's a much better, uh, civilized, uh, <laughs> totally different environment? That's how it should be. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. That's, that's the, the goal. Okay. And I think that things are slowly moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still difficult for a lot of uh, productions and, you know, every film is different and mm -hmm. so there are different circumstances. and. You know, unexpected things can happen during shooting that can mm -hmm. cause problems. Uh, but I mean, companies like CJ, for example, have committed to kind of a standard contract for mm -hmm. staff members. Right. And so, regarding working hours and overtime pay, mm -hmm. and you know, when you do that, it's inevitable that the budget goes up. Like right. you can't make a, a film at a lower budget right. um, if you pay everybody well. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, it's it's a sad truth and. Yeah. But it is very important, I think, mm -hmm. you know, and because filmmaking in Korea is a big industry, mm -hmm. that this is the direction that commercial filmmaking needs to move. Right. Uh, I mean, independent films is more tricky because, you know, it's simply not possible to make really low budget films mm -hmm. in a way where you can pay the staff high wages. And, right. you know, the staff right. knows this in mm -hmm. advance, mm -hmm. um, but they're willing to kind of donate their time and their energy to right. a project that right. they believe in. Teaching at school, mm. these young uh, potential talents and so mm -hmm. on, do you sense in their minds, in their heart, because of the hard uh, you know, overall atmosphere of uh, movie making, do you see some students getting disenchanted about or getting negative about the future of Korea's movie making industry in the future? What's the impact um, from what we hear about what happens mm. at the movie making mm -hmm. sets on the young people's mind and the way they see the future? Well, uh, the young people want to be a part of it. I mean, they love cinema, they, they love making movies, and uh, they have a lot to say. So, for example, um, at, at Sogang, where I teach, uh, mm -hmm. I'm interested in not telling or instructing the students, this is the way you have to do, mm -hmm. make a movie, this is the way you have to direct it. If I have 15 students, I'd like to have 15 different films, 15 different looks, mm -hmm. uh, 15 different ways of them uh, approaching it. So I think nurturing the different ways that uh, students want to express themselves uh, is important. Um, and while a lot of the, the students go on into the film industry in a mm -hmm. variety of capacities, um, I think that uh, the hardest part for when I came out of film school, or mm -hmm. actually before I went, when I came out of college, mm -hmm. actually before I went to film school, was, uh, you know, surviving. Mm -hmm. Surviving those first uh, few years, right, right. Um, and I was fortunate way back when in the <laughs> gosh 1980s. Mm -hmm. I, I, in New York at that time, uh, you could live relatively cheaply as a beginning artist. Mm -hmm. I was able to freelance, uh, working on music videos, working mm -hmm. on documentaries, working on commercials, and have enough time to really find out what it is uh, I was really good at and what it is I really want to do. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the, the pressure here with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you got to make up your mind, you got to get instant success. Uh, uh, yeah. The pressure uh, is what's, I think, the hardest, uh, the hardest uh, situation for mm -hmm. uh, maybe young people today. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I see. you have to have a, you know, a room, a community, and an environment right. where Give them you more can time. experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or just mm -hmm. uh, the ability to uh, make, make a, a living, mm -hmm. uh, right. working from job to job, mm -hmm. and um, feeling like, yes, you know, it will right. take three or four or five years right. to maybe make your first feature. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, you mm. should uh, take that time to really make a, make a good one. Mm -hmm. From what you know, Professor Ungar described in the, the, the New York scene, for instance, right? Yeah. Do you see a lot of difference here in Korea? Lots of stress for young people who are working uh, mm. on the sets and stuff. Uh, have you observed those? Yeah, I mean, one thing that's distinctive about Korea is just there's so many people in Korea who want to make films. Mm. And so, so you're saying the, the, the supply side of the talent is quite sufficient and quite big. It is, okay. and I mean, that's reflecting, a reflection in part in, of the passion that Koreans have for filmmaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a huge talent base, and so that's a big advantage for the film industry. But for individual filmmakers, it is a real challenge to kind of get yourself noticed. Uh, I mean, one thing that a lot of filmmakers do is they just kind of pick up a camera and they make a film mm -hmm. on their own power right. um, with you know money that their grandmother might give them. Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, personal money, right. and it's a tremendous personal risk for many mm -hmm. filmmakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of them are successful, but 
even with very low budget movies, it's still impact. Yeah, I mean, time. you have to as as low as you get the budget, mm -hmm. I mean, you'd still have to spend some minimal amount of money. Mm -hmm. And if you're making a feature film, then it's going to be a significant personal commitment mm -hmm. and risk. And so I, you know, I feel really bad for for young filmmakers who are struggling to establish themselves in Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that I think that. People who are more established need to be aware of and need to do everything they can to mm -hmm. support young filmmakers in right. different ways. Right. And the and, government uh, can help I would also well. say, especially like in the United States, uh, more uh, female directors or mm -hmm. cinematographers mm -hmm. or, or producers or so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think like uh, the, the industry, my, my impression of it, as well as with uh, the Hollywood industry, that is still very uh, male centric and that uh, there's. Uh, I think for them it's twice as hard mm -hmm. sometimes to break in, mm -hmm. and uh, they got wonderful stories to tell and and really great skills and talent uh, as well. Uh, in the moving making teams, we know of several big names as a contributor, uh, you know, like art director and the, the music, mm -hmm. who are very famous as, as female, you know, the artist. Yeah. But I guess in terms of movie making and movie directors, we still wait for larger number of female. Uh, movie directors to come into the scene, I suppose, in that sense. And uh, going back to Mr. Paquette, what you're talking about, the independent films, you have actually founded, I suppose, yes. the, the Wildflower Film Awards. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, this effort and how does it relate to overall the society-wide uh, mm -hmm. support or lack of it in, in supporting the uh, independent movie industry here in Korea? Yeah, I mean, basically it's an effort to recognize the work of independent filmmakers mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, I don't know how aware of this mainstream audiences are, but if you look at all the, the independent films that are released in a given year, it's quite a large number. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there might be 20 or 30 documentaries, right. but also 60 or 70 feature films. But they're not being shown enough, right? That's right. And right. so That's the, problem. Mm -hmm. the only way to really encounter these films is mm -hmm. to go out and to search them out directly. Mm -hmm. And so marketing is a big issue for independent films. We need to give more publicity to independent right. filmmakers. And more venues. Yeah. Exactly, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so, I mean, this is... Uh, do, don't we have enough interest in independent films? Like me, I want yeah. to watch these <laughs> films, but they're just not shown, right? Yeah. The interest side mm -hmm. is there, isn't there? I think it is. Mm -hmm. And you see independent films occasionally break out right. and to reach a wider audience. Mm -hmm. uh, but. But we need to work hard just to make that happen more often because, you know, it's a simple question of economics sometimes or yeah. like, you know, distribution power. Um, you know, occasionally uh, a bigger distributor will get behind an independent film and push mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always, I mean, the odds are always against independent filmmakers. But I don't know mm -hmm. whether it's a question of a bigger distribution, at least just mm -hmm. offering a venue. One mm -hmm. or yeah. two venues in a city would be uh, enough. And or 10 or 12. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah that mean. would be more, even more desirable. Oh, but yeah. just say, I hear mm -hmm. about this independent movie and no. I, there's no place to go to watch. That mm -hmm. is a real problem. I'm willing yeah. to travel as far as I can within this great yeah. city of Seoul. And I wonder, the academic environment, like Seogang mm -hmm. University, for instance, mm -hmm. we don't want to put Seogang University on spot, but, <laughs> but you know, film schools that, that yeah. you, you, you work mm -hmm. and other schools elsewhere, mm -hmm. can we find a solution about like, uh, offering these kind of uh, venues for showing those kind of movies in a more academic settings, perhaps? Well, I mean, like, public like for example, like at Seogang, we're trying to raise um, uh, funding mm -hmm. for uh, thesis students to make a, their first feature or their first uh, documentary. So when they go out, they can go to a film festival with a quality product. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'm also uh, trying to do is to have the, the, the students uh, form their own production companies mm -hmm. and form their own creative teams while mm -hmm. also having one foot uh, in the door working with established companies as well. Because uh, usually the people that you meet at film school are your future collaborators. And I think um, what I love to see is how the students themselves, uh, you know, not only are working to express themselves, but mm -hmm. learning to work together to express uh, a vision. So, you know, I have one student who uh, gets shown at the Mise en Scène Film Festival last semester, mm -hmm. and then through there he meets a, a, a filmmaker from the United Kingdom. Right. Now he's in London working on his project. Mm -hmm. And so that synergy between uh, the young filmmakers in the independent scene, right. um, I think is uh, crucial right. uh, for um, uh, film schools to nurture. And mm -hmm. also, I'd also add that um, I think it's also important for film schools to 
uh, teach also low budget mm -hmm. uh, ways Movie of making, making the first films. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great to, and that's, you know, that's what, in, in my class, I show all types of movies. But I also, you know, say, well, this is the, you know, the high budget approach and this is the low budget approach. Mm -hmm. If you can't get a steady cam, mm -hmm. how can you make your own steady cam? Right. You know, uh, how can you make uh, your own dolly or so? Or how can you uh, take what students are always facing is financial, um, financial restraints. Mm -hmm. And how can you take those restraints and find the creativity mm -hmm. within them? Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of my favorite stories is Orson Welles, mm -hmm. uh, one of the great filmmakers right. from America. Right. He was constantly run out of money in his career. And uh, <laughs> he was doing one um, film somewhere, I think, in Spain. And uh, they had no money for costumes mm -hmm. the next day. So he staged it in a bathhouse. I and see. people thought that was brilliant. It was genius, <laughs> you know. And so, right. um, so I hope you know. With like at Sogong, uh, what we're trying to provide is uh, a training ground. Right. Training the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, find your style, find your voice, and let us help you connect you to uh, the industry. Whether you want to go mainstream mm -hmm. or uh, independent, right. and that also includes, I think, music videos, mm -hmm. documentaries, sure. television shows, and uh, commercials, and um, transmedia, of course. where a story can be uh, mm -hmm. go on a variety of different platforms. Right, right, indeed. So, Professor Ongor mentioned about the supply side of encouraging these new talents and an independent movie making here. But on the uh, the demand side of it, we mm -hmm. have seen a few some of the biggest names distributors in Korea setting up their own. Uh, what do you call it, the, the, the theaters dedicated to independent uh, movie yep. showing, but I just find it's just not sufficient, uh, mm -hmm. not enough. Uh, yeah. Do you know, do you see more of such uh, efforts being made coming in our way or not? I mean, mm -hmm. because it seems to be such an important question for ensuring continuous flow and supply of the talents for the future for the movie industry here. Yeah. I mean, it is a really difficult thing. I mean, there is, for example, an independent theater called Indie Space, right. which is, mm -hmm. it's one screen that within the Seoul Theater mm -hmm. in Chongna. And, you know, they believe very passionately in providing a venue for independent films. Right. And some of the films that they screen are only available there and not mm -hmm. anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's just a real struggle to make it work economically. And yeah. so they have, you know, different fundraisers where people come and they donate money to help the... Mm -hmm. The theater survive, right. uh, but you know there's just there's so much demand on people's time, mm -hmm. and you know some people have an interest, kind of an abstract interest in independent film, but uh, get distracted by other things in life, mm -hmm. and you know and then other big movies come out and they want to see those as well, and mm -hmm. so uh, they may not get to these small independent theaters as often as they would like to, right. uh, and so in a situation like that you just need to keep trying. <laughs> I mean mm -hmm. there's no there's no magic bullet, but I think that you know, kind of constant effort to right. kind of spread more word about independent films mm -hmm. will help. I guess overall, uh, our observation here today is like uh, with the occasion of uh, PIF, uh, you know, Busan In International Film Festival, we mm -hmm. celebrate the wonderful success of Korean movie industry and sure. especially on the commercial side, all sure. these big names coming up. Uh, big blockbusters on, in our own way, I suppose, uh, movie goers uh, exceeding 10 million people and so on. So we celebrate those positive sides, but because we are mindful of the future, uh, continuous success of Korean movie industry, we are talking about all these uh, problems and issues that needs to be resolved. And in that mm -hmm. regard, I think both of our uh, guests, Darcy Paquette and then Mr. Uh, the, Michael Unger, both of you have contributed big time in terms of sharing the, the mm. uh, big picture with our audience here. Thank you very much. Mm, thank thank you. you. And we want to thank our viewers for having joined us from all around the world to understand this very interesting issue for this country. And next time when we talk about important issues that matters for Korea as well as the world, we want to ask you once again to join us back into this program up front. Until then, this has been Kim Byung-joo.